Even though the roster of playable characters featured within the main series Final Fantasy games often focuses on youthful vigour, over the years Square started to feel it was necessary to include older, more mature characters to help balance things out and provide some different perspectives. The first instance of this arguably came with Yosef or Joseph in Final Fantasy 2, but he wasn't ever given a specific age. So even though it was implied that he was older due to his physical appearance, we also have to consider that Guy is supposed to be 16 years old, which if he was a character in the Inbetweeners would mean that his mother would still be purchasing his undergarments. As the franchise expanded further, this archetype of character became more commonplace, and the SNES games often included a good mix of youth and experience. If we look at the cast of Final Fantasy IV and VI for example, there was a lot of diversity, ranging from youthful characters like Rydia through to the battle-hardened characters like Yang and Setsa, and then the quizzically older folk like Teller and Strago. But as the franchise moved onto the PlayStation, this range narrowed down, something which coincided with the gradual shrinking of cast size. It meant that although we would still get the youthful exuberance of characters like Cloud and Zidane, the experience came from characters like Barrett, Sid and Steiner, characters who were in their 30s and 40s as opposed to being over 60. And yes, although technically Queena is 89, Queena isn't really a character in the traditional mould, let's say. It means that if we exclude Queena, we haven't had a character in the 60 plus age bracket within the main numbered games since Strago in Final Fantasy VI, which was quite a long time ago. As they therefore looked to build out the cast of Final Fantasy X, the developers decided to stick with this newer trend. It meant that we would receive the youthful exuberance in characters like Tidus, Yuna and Riku. There were some battle-hardened characters in their 20s in the form of Waka, Lulu and Kamari, and there would be one slot left for the experienced old guard, Oren. Except instead of being in his 60s, Oren was actually only 35. Nonetheless, despite this relatively young age, he was the perfect adaptation of this older mentor role, as it was his role to guide the party and provide small nuances within the execution of the narrative that made you, the player, aware of things that weren't always as they seemed. This was done in such a subtle way though, that taking away how awesome he is, it can be easy to forget how important Oren is to the plot of Final Fantasy X, as without his tale of woe, sacrifice and loyalty, little would have actually changed in the world of Spira. But I guess that's why he's so popular, and it would explain why there have been so many requests over the last six months for us to cover his story, because it encompasses so much of Spira's past and present. Before we dive into Oren's origins though, I do want to highlight that I will not be covering the topic of Chuami within this video. Until we gain more clarification from Square Enix around whether she is actually Oren's daughter or not, and if she is, how that situation came to be, I feel as though it would be somewhat irresponsible for me to start theorising as that's just not the purpose of these videos. I also just want to remind everyone that even if you are already subscribed to Final Fantasy Union, please make sure you hit that notification bell to make sure you get notified when we publish new content. And make sure you let us know in the comments who you would like us to see cover in a future Origins video. Alright, so let's get started with Oren's Origins. Oren was born 35 years prior to the events of Final Fantasy X, and along with much of Spira's populace, in his early life he became heavily ingrained in learning about the ways of Yevon. These teachings have been put in place hundreds of years prior due to the fallout from the Machine War, and with Sin serving as a constant reminder of why they were necessary, it was something that people took very seriously. Some though, did take them more seriously than others, and as Oren delved deeper and deeper into the teachings of Yevon, he started to dream of becoming part of Yevon's hierarchy. By the age of 25, Oren had started to make real progress in this regard, and he had begun to make quite a name for himself as a warrior monk. His determination and focus were noted as particularly admirable qualities, and it led to the higher up Yevon officials taking notice of his achievements. As part of this, they looked for ways that they could start to integrate Oren more into the inner circle of Yevon, but unfortunately for Oren, this meant that the dreams that he'd held for so long would be dashed before he could realise them. After keeping an eye on Oren, the upper echelons of Yevon were keen for him to become second in command of the warrior monks, and they had been grooming him for this particular role for some time. 
But as with most things within the political realm of Yevon, there were strings attached. If Oren wanted to achieve this ambition, he would need to take part in an arranged marriage with the daughter of one of Yevon's highest ranking priests. When Oren learnt about this stipulation, he was angered and upset. It went against many of the morals that he had developed on a personal level, and it therefore meant that he didn't consider it to be an appropriate request. He had been an exemplary member of Yevon to this point, but based on his convictions, he ultimately refused to go forward with the marriage, something which, much to his dismay, led to his name being tarnished throughout Yevon. The promotion that was within his reach was therefore taken away, given to one of his peers named Wen Kenok, and he was no longer as well liked or respected within the clergy. Everything that he had worked so hard to build had slipped away, and it started to become a dark time for Oren. Fortunately, around this time, a summoner named Braska was in Bravel. He was desperate to defeat Sin following the death of his wife, but having married an Albed and fathering a half-breed child named Yuna, Braska was looked down upon by Yevonites. As he was making his final preparations before heading off on his pilgrimage to try and defeat Sin nonetheless, Braska looked for people in similar situations, outcasts of Yevon with something to prove. Learning of Oren's fall from grace, Braska sought him out, and after Oren found Braska to be both noble and genuine, unlike those he had known in Yevon, he gladly accepted his request to be his guardian. Braska then decided to seek out another guardian to join them, but it led to protests from Oren, not because he was against having additional help, it was more he objected to who Braska had in mind, a man named Jekt, who had recently been arrested for disturbing the peace with his drunken proclamations about his life in Zanakin, a city which had been destroyed 1000 years prior. Many felt his claims were outlandish, as well as offensive, including Oren, but Braska believed that there was some truth in Jekt's claims, and after reminding Oren of his own personal failings within the eyes of Yevon, Oren reluctantly agreed to let Jekt join them, and the three prepared to leave Bavel. It saw the start of a rather interesting relationship that would have a rather rocky introduction, but would develop bonds that would outlast even death. And this was signified by one of Jekt's first actions, to purchase a sphere recorder so that he could capture moments to show his son Tidus, who was still back in Zanakand. At the time, Oren saw this as a highly unprofessional action, but as time passed, he would start to learn the value of such actions. After leaving Bavel, Oren guarded Braska as they ventured to Besaide to start collecting the aeons that were required to complete the pilgrimage. On the way, they passed the Moonflow, where Jekt unfortunately cost him a lot of their savings, having attacked a Shupuff while drunk. Although this particular action had never happened before, it was something systematic, and it led to Oren berating Jekt yet again on his lack of professionalism. But this time, Jekt actually listened, swearing off alcohol completely. This single admission by Jekt saw a drastic change in his relationship with Oren. With Jekt now sober, Oren could start to see the value that he brought to Braska, and something of a mutual respect started to form between the pair. When they then reached Besaid, Oren accepted a rather personal request from Braska. Having complete faith in their ability to defeat Sin, Braska knew that this would mean his seven-year-old daughter, who was currently being looked after elsewhere, would be left without any parents. He therefore requested that Oren bring his daughter to Besaid, so that she could live in the place that he'd fallen in love with during his time there. Having nothing but respect for Braska, Oren naturally accepted that it would be an honour to perform such a task. But as they collected the remaining aeons and ventured deep within Zanakin's cloister, the reality of this request came to the fore, and the bonds that had been formed between the group would be tested. Not because they were at odds with each other, but because they cared too much to let each other go. Having encountered Unileska, they were told the unfortunate truth, that there was no final Aeon as the Faith had died out years before. Instead, one of Braska's guardians would have to sacrifice themselves to become the new Faith for the final Aeon. This was a shocking revelation for Oren. He had been a devout Yevonite for much of his life and had dedicated himself to understanding the teachings, but now he was being told by Unileska, who had been unsent for almost a millennium, that they should sacrifice themselves even though Sin may well just return anyway? It was too much, and Oren protested. He wouldn't just let Braska throw his life away like that, he was adamant that there must be another way. Ultimately though, it wasn't his decision, and both Braska and Jekt agreed to continue on. Despite having spent this time together and forming strong bonds, 
Oren could never truly understand Braska's motivations, nor Jekt's. Having lost his wife at the hands of Sin, Braska hoped to offer people a guaranteed time of safety so that they wouldn't have to suffer such widespread grief even if it only lasted for a short period of time. And there was also the chance that Sin wouldn't come back. And Jekt? He had become so convinced that there was no way for him to return home, but he did at least fill Oren with hope. He promised that he would find a way to break the cycle. With this, Oren then relented and begrudgingly let them proceed through to Unaleska to give their lives in the fight against Sin. And as he had done with Braska in Besaid when he promised to look after Yuna, he now promised Jekt that he would look after Tidus. Although he did initially hesitate as he had no idea how he'd actually get to Dream's Anakin. Now alone, Oren had fulfilled his role as Braska's guardian and made himself into a legendary figure without Spira, but something just didn't feel right. The more he thought about the end of the pilgrimage and the lies that Yevon had told the people, the more and more he became angered by the situation. He therefore decided to return to Zanakind to confront Lady Unaleska regarding the falsities that surrounded the final summoning. It was here that she chose to enlighten Oren as to the truth about Sin, that it was unending, with no hope of ever being conquered. There was no way to break the cycle. Hearing this, Having just seen his friends willingly give their lives for what turned out to be a false hope, it enraged Oren, and in response, he attempted to attack Lady Unaleska. But even with his experience as a warrior monk, his skills paled in comparison to those of Unaleska, and she battered him away with ease. It led to Oren suffering severe injuries, including the loss of sight in his right eye, but he was at least still alive. Through sheer determination, Oren then managed to make his way back through Zanakand and down to the foot of Mount Gagazet. When Oren then reached the Calm Lands, Rin and Albed found him struggling and decided to patch him up at his nearby travel agency. Oren was of course appreciative, but he also knew the severity of his wounds, and he wanted to make sure that he kept his promise to Braska, so he headed to Bavel to make sure that Yuna was safe. It was a step too far though, as although Oren was a fearsome warrior, the wounds he had sustained against Unalesco caught up to him. He was dying. Fortunately, he crossed paths with a young Ronso named Kamari, who like Oren, had also been disgraced by those who shared similar beliefs. It meant that even though the two only shared a brief moment together, Oren trusted his intuition and entrusted Kamari with finding Yuna, taking her to Besaid, and watching over her as her guardian. With this request made, Oren passed away, but he had become bound to Spira and remained as an unsent due to the promises he had made to both Braska and Jekt. Taking full advantage of this new undead status, Oren was able to ride Jekt's sin to Dream's Anakin while it was still docile, and it was here that he began to watch over Tidus. With Tidus's mother then passing away, Oren took up the role of both parent and mentor, and it was something that he took quite seriously. Oren even encouraged Tidus to pursue his dreams of becoming a Blitzball star and offered him constructive feedback on his performances. But even though they were close, Oren chose never to reveal to Tidus anything about Spira, the depth of his relationship with Jekt, or even the fact that he actually knew his father. That was until the night of the Jekt Memorial Cup, 10 years after Jekt had disappeared and Braska had brought about the most recent calm. Oren had toyed with spending his days in Dreams Anakin, watching over Tidus in safety, but when Sin attacked that day, he decided to bring Tidus to Spira so that he could have a chance at real life. But he chose to only reveal small fragments of information to Tidus about what was about to happen, and indeed, what was happening. And this was a purposeful act. He wanted much of what Tidus was about to experience to be fresh and unfiltered, so that he could view everything with no preconceived notions. Yes, he did give him small nuggets, like giving him the sword that was a gift from his father, but that was about it. He just had to have faith that Tidus was now strong enough to fend for himself, and after finding that Tidus had somehow managed to make his way to Luca, he was confident that now was the time to divulge more pieces of the puzzle, including the relationship he had developed with Jekt 10 years prior, and that Jekt was Sin, the monstrosity that he had experienced firsthand numerous times now. This was naturally a lot for Tidus to take in, but Oren had little time for sympathy. Indeed, Spirit in general was an unsympathetic place, and Oren's immediate concern was reconnecting with Yuna after all these years. 
Having learned that she was undertaking a pilgrimage of her own, he was keen to make sure that she didn't repeat the same mistakes as her father and offered his services as a guardian so that he could watch over her and also Tidus, who he knew would almost certainly be forced to follow his lead as he searched for answers in this foreign land. It meant that Orin was now reunited with the two children whom he'd sworn to protect and it was a responsibility that he took very seriously. Using his experience, Orin determined that if Yuna had the same resolve as her father, he would need to help her understand the truth in her own way, and while he did divulge information periodically to Tidus about what was going on, he made the decision to guide Yuna instead of telling her what she would come to expect, and to that end, he made it his resolve to keep her focused on her pilgrimage no matter what. That was easier said than done though, as Spirit was going through much turmoil, as Orin found out when they stumbled upon Operation Meehan. Although it was somewhat damaging for some party members to see, for Orin, it was something that he would have much rather avoided as it forced him to engage with people he would have rather forgotten, the Maesters of Yevon, and more specifically, Wen Kenok, someone whom he hadn't seen for 10 years. Having learned of the fallacy that Yevon represented, Orin attempted to bite his tongue in their presence, especially as he had no ill will towards Kenok on a personal level over what had happened in the past, but having witnessed such a significant loss of life following their devilish scheming, he couldn't help but make a snide comment at Kinok's expense. When they then ventured inside Jose Temple, Oren continued to see the irony and hypocrisy of Yevon. This time, it was a statue of Lord Braska, who was now classed as a champion of Yevon, despite the religion choosing to ostracise him following his unsanctioned marriage and birth of a half-breed child. Acting as the watchful guardian, Orin knew that even though Yuna had strong resolve, she was also very naive. And as they entered Guado Salon, he started to realise that things weren't quite as they seemed. From their actions at Mihen, he became to appreciate that the maesters were even more corrupt with power than he was used to, and that they would happily abuse that power when given the opportunity. His fear was that Yuna was becoming a pawn in a much bigger plot but he did nonetheless choose to stick with his overriding plan. Even though he did choose to say something when Seymour played some of his hand, he made sure to stay somewhat out of Yuna's affairs and made it clear that Tidus and the other guardians should do the same. He knew that she would ask for help when it was needed as again, she needed to learn the truth about Yevon for herself, but he also wanted to make sure that she didn't bite off more than she could chew. When they then saw Jiskal Guado's sphere inside Makalania Temple, Oren realised that he could no longer sit on the sidelines. Yuna was in serious danger, and to ensure that she continued on the path that he wanted her to follow, he needed to act. He therefore led the group in deciding to go to Yuna's aid against Maester Seymour, and it turned out to be a critical decision. Seymour was slain, and they became traitors in the eyes of Yevon. But despite all of this, and the effect it had on the group, Oren cared little for their emotions and sentiments. He needed them to focus on the pilgrimage, and he imparted some knowledge about the weakness of Yevon that inspired Yuna. The faith were the ones that gave the power to summoners, not some proxy religious organisation. Still, when Yuna decided that they should visit Bavel to receive their penance, he did concede to her wishes. Unfortunately, this plan was waylaid as Sin transported everyone to Bikinel Desert, and with Yuna kidnapped by the Guado, Oren joined the Albed to escape on board the Fahrenheit. It was yet another annoying distraction, and while they were searching for Yuna, Oren ended up in a heated debate with Sid as to what would happen after she was rescued. Oren, of course, was keen for Yuna to continue with her pilgrimage, but Sid was vehemently opposed to this, and after recognising how passionate Sid was about this, Oren chose to cede, perhaps because he knew that changing Yuna's mind against her will would be easier said than done. Secretly, he was no doubt hoping to see Sid try it in order to bear witness to the disastrous results. After they identified that Yuna was being held at the Palace of St. Bavel, the Guardians led a daring rescue, and although it was somewhat successful, what they learnt about Yevon only served to Oren as justification for his actions in defying the religious organisation. Yet again, they were flagrant displays of corruption and hypocrisy, as shown by the open use of machina and their abuse of the judicial system in sentencing them to crimes that they had not committed. Upon then hearing Yuna plead her case against the Masters of Yevon, Oren was left to reflect on the world in which he'd brought Tidus into. Spira was ultimately in a cycle of death, spiralling endlessly, but even though their situation was dire, as they faced execution, Oren was still confident that he could guide Tidus and Yuna on the path to ending this spiral. 
but even though Oren's resolve was strong, it too would soon be tested. As they escaped from Via Purifico, they were accosted by Seymour, who displayed the cold, dead body of Wen Kinok. Even though Oren had begun to lose respect for his old comrade due to the corruption he'd seen within Yevon, this shocked him and it led to Oren acting rather rashly as Seymour morphed into Seymour Natus. Looking to protect his summoner, Kamari attacked Seymour, and realising that this was their chance to escape and continue on with the pilgrimage, Oren ordered everyone else to withdraw. There had been other times, such as Makalania Temple, where Oren had issued commands to the group, but this was the first time that there would be serious repercussions involved. Kamari could die, and although Oren tried to defend his decision to leave him behind, Yuna refused, choosing to return to the fray alongside her friend. It was an action that drew a wry smile from the veteran guardian. Her dedication and commitment to not only her pilgrimage, but also her friends, was something that Oren respected. That, and the chance for revenge, led him to also return to the battle against Seymour. As they then dueled against Seymour again at the summit of Mount Gagazet, something he said struck a chord with Yuna. And although Oren attempted to aggressively dismiss Seymour's claims as lies, the group started to realise that Oren actually knew more than he was letting on. First, Yuna accused him of such, and then he was forced to dismiss Riku following similar claims. He knew though that they needed to just follow the path a little while longer, as soon they would find out the horrifying truth about Yevon and the final summoning for themselves. In preparation for this, Oren shared a softer moment with Yuna. For the first time, he chose to enlighten her about the journey ahead, and after hearing her response, he declared that her father would be proud. Oren also chose to share a similar moment with Tidus not too long after, while also subtly revealing to him his overall objective. He wanted to make Tidus feel more comfortable in his emotional state, and he reminisced about how 10 years earlier, he too had felt his resolve waver as they were on the eve of reaching Xanakind. But by doing so, he also wanted Tidus to look at his failures and learn, so that he wouldn't repeat the same mistakes that Oren had made in the past. Even though Oren had taken a back seat throughout much of their journey, he took the various roles he'd volunteered for very seriously. Above all else, he wanted to save Spira from its endless cycle of suffering, and to that end, he had been discreetly advising both Yuna and Tidus so that when the time came, they would make the right choice. On a more personal level though, he also wanted to make sure that he did right by both Braska and Jekt. He wanted to keep their children safe, as if they were his own. That didn't stop him from being distracted by emotions from the past though, as when they initially spoke to Unaleska, Oren became frustrated by having to relive the events from 10 years prior. When they then went to query Unaleska further, the parallels between Oren and Tidus that had grown over time were confirmed. As Tidus challenged Unaleska in objection to her statements, the Pyreflies generated Oren's similar objections from the past. Yuna, having witnessed these events and having heard Unaleska's thoughts, then chose the path that Oren had guided her toward, the path of light, not death, the path that represented freedom and change and would mean their fate would no longer be defined by someone else. They would be able to write their own stories. Seeing this, Oren realised that it was finally time for him to act. It was his moment to shine. His plan had worked, and with Yuna having laid down the groundwork for their opposition to the system, Oren gave a rousing speech that inspired Yuna and her guardians to fight a 1000 year old tradition and defeat Unaleska. As they then started to uncover more about how Sin could be defeated without the final Aeon, Oren chose to offer Tidus some praise. Except unlike his praise for Yuna, this was more of a backhanded compliment. It couldn't mask the fact that he was proud of Tidus though, because it was true. He had done well and he had managed to achieve what Oren couldn't. They had found another way. Like Tidus though, as they entered into the critical path to fight against Jekt and Yu Yevon, Oren knew that this would be the last time he would fight together with his comrades. But after seeing Jekt again and ensuring that Sin would be defeated, he knew that it was his time to move on from the mortal realm. His mission had been completed and he left this new world in the hands of the next generation. And so, that concludes the story of Oren. And in my opinion, it was a rather fitting one as even though Oren was a very influential character within the cast of Final Fantasy X, he often stayed in the shadows and influenced things in a subtle way. His conclusion therefore struck the right chord with me as it was both extremely dignified and respectful. Having learnt much from his earlier mistakes in life, Oren chose to effectively take on the role of parent to his two friends' children. The only difficulty he had 
was that they were in completely separate locations, so while he was able to have a more long-term influence on Tidus, he had to trust that Yuna would be fine based on the decisions he was forced to make. It therefore created a dynamic with his storytelling that I feel was rather unique. You could see him wanting to influence proceedings, but also struggling to make sure he didn't go too far. It was a balancing act between Yuna and Tidus. He needed to keep them both motivated, but they both had a very different relationship with him. To Yuna, Oren was the legendary guardian who protected her father, but to Tidus, Oren was just some guy who appeared after his father disappeared and kind of stuck around. I think it's nice that they therefore chose to include those small scenes between Oren, Yuna and Tidus as it helped to highlight the relationships that he had with both of them. Perhaps it's why Oren also resonated so much with players because he did fulfill that parental role. Often throughout the franchise, we have been presented by characters who are either the same age as us or just older but unrelatable. Oren was different in this regard and I'm glad they chose to tell his story in the way that they did. But yeah, with that small analysis out of the way, that marks the end of this Origins video. If you've made it this far, make sure you give yourself a customary pat on the back in the comments. If you enjoyed it, be sure to also hit that like button, share this video around to all the people you know who love Final Fantasy X, and why not subscribe to our channel too? Also, be sure to let me know what you thought, and feel free to let us know what Oren means to you as a character. Why not also consider supporting us on Patreon? You get the satisfaction of knowing that you're helping us to create these kind of videos and you'll get rewarded by, amongst other things, putting your name at the end of videos like these guys. Alright everyone, thank you so much for joining me on this deep dive into the lore of Final Fantasy X. This is Daryl, signing out. I will see you all next time for more Final Fantasy videos.